Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, we're going to now uh, talk about the insights from the natural products world. And just by way of introduction, a couple of, uh, a couple of quick slides uh, on who we are. Sterling Rice uh, is a brand strategy and innovation firm. We are Boulder-based, 130 people. We uh, had our origins in the natural products industry almost 30 years ago. We're extremely consumer-centric. Uh, solving for the intersection of unmet consumer needs, commercial viability, and company competencies in our strategy and innovation work. And uh, we're also joined by our partner, New Hope Natural Media. They run Expo East and West, publish natural food merchandiser, functional ingredients, nutrition business journal, New Hope 360, among other things. And uh, this uh, uh, we have jointly undertaken uh, uh, an initiative to help understand the many threads and many trends that collectively define the macro forces driving the uh, natural products industry. And uh, we will be drawing on this in the material that you're going to see today, which is very future focused. What we're going to uh, do is very quickly scan the past century for some context on modern diet and uh, natural products industry genesis and growth. We will also draw on our Futures 2020 work in detailing several of the macro forces. You can see them on the agenda slide. And uh, I'm joined by Carlotta Mast from New Hope and Kevin Witcher, uh, also from Sterling Rice Group, who will be chiming in in a moment. Um, very quickly on the last century, at the turn of the century, 80% of our population was rural, most of them farmers. Uh, and so we've seen a very dramatic unfolding. It was really around post-war where a big pivot point took place uh, in the development of uh, suburban and urban shifts, and as well a very fundamental demographic shift with women increasingly moving into the workforce. Uh, today, as you know, we are just over 50% of the world's population living in cities, and a mere 2% of the U.S. population uh, are farmers. So this has had really enormous implications on the lengthening of the food supply chain, uh, and we're going to look at some of those developments, advances, unintended consequences, and implications. All right, I'm going to take 90 seconds here to hydroplane over the last century to identify a couple of key milestones that uh, really inform where we're headed. Uh, at 1900, uh, the telephone, electric light, automobile, and inorganic fertilizers were all invented, but not yet commercialized. Um, the uh, internal combustion engine triggered a major uh, increase in agricultural productivity. Um, interestingly, in 1911, Procter & Gamble, which was a candle-making business and a soap-making business, saw the uh, advent of the electric light threatening their business. And faced with massive excess capacity in cottonseed oil processing, they did something very smart, which is they hired the patent holder for hydrogenation of liquids. And, uh, and by utilizing cottonseed oil in this way, an iconic product, Crisco, was born. And it really ushered in the era of shelf-stable foods in the United States. So from really a position of scarcity and worrying about not getting enough food, uh, we moved uh, in the next couple of decades uh, and, uh, and saw some great productivity gains, again, from the machine age and the introduction of inorganic fertilizers. And uh, interestingly, they, those productivity gains contributed to the collapse of prices, uh, which um, ushered in the Great Depression and also ushered in the beginning of uh, uh, crop subsidies and uh, changes in agri agricultural policy, which, however well intended, have helped define the way we eat today. And finally, fast forward to post-World War II, the suburban and urban life. Uh, the war triggered a lot of advances in food science around shelf stability, food safety, pathogen control. And we saw the uh, acceleration of fast food supermarkets and convenience foods. And 
and we're all very, uh, very familiar with, sorry, um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we had a rising standard of living, lower relative cost of food uh, versus other cultures, the lengthening uh, further of the food supply chain with a trend toward monoculture, specialization, hybridization, uh, particularly in our staple foods, corn and soy. We got very, very clever at deconstructing and reprocessing macronutrients and I uh, got really good at developing cheap calories that were shelf stable. Three more quick milestones. 1980 uh, represented kind of the intersection of ethics and technology and uh, another stream which was the natural, the genesis of the natural foods movement. Whole Foods Market was founded in 1980. In 1990, organic standards were formalized by the USDA. And uh, only in 1996 were genetically modified crops approved for commercial application. And of course today between corn, so corn soy, and cotton, uh, upward of 80% and in some crops upward of 90% of all domestic production is genetically modified. And you're probably all familiar with those very dramatic uh, CDC obesity maps. Uh, so really from 1990 began this incredibly steep curve uh, of rising obesity, uh, which now, of course, uh, affects two-thirds of all adult Americans. Uh, unfortunately, we know that we have a robust pipeline of future chronic disease and healthcare spending with the childhood obesity uh, academic, uh, epi epidemic. So from its nascent beginnings, we now have a natural products industry that is very, very healthy and no longer a niche. Um, I won't spend too much time on the data, but 130 billion plus uh, between the natural living segment, supplements, and food and beverage. And those growth rates um, of high single digits, um, while, while having come off considerably from the 20 or so percent growth in the early days of the natural and organic ingredient are still uh, about three times the growth rate of the conventional market. Here you'll see the breakdown uh, by, uh, by segment and sub-segment, um, the largest being the natural, organic, and functional food market, 30 billion in supplements, another 15 billion in the emerging natural living market. Again, this will be part of the package we send out, so we'll um, let you have that data and uh, uh, won't go into the detail. Um, so we've reached a kind of a tipping point, and to uh, put a fine point on the fact that this is no longer a niche, this is a quote uh, from Paul Pullman, who is the CEO of Unilever, former bigwig at Nestle and at Procter & Gamble. And he says the financial sector, multinational companies like ourselves, and governments have to question the way we do business, the way we exercise our rights, and what have uh, been called capitalism. We need a new sustainable model, one which business sits as a part of the society, not separate, and where the focus is on the long term. So um, interesting, uh, couldn't be a more mainstream company with a perspective that certainly uh, echoes some of the voices that founded the natural products industry. And now we're going to uh, show you a brief uh, video and uh, that will introduce the, uh, the um, source of the content that we're about to share. The next report is about what's next and it's an annual report. It's the natural products industry forecast for 2013. Consumers really are demanding more from the food they eat, and they should, because it's very, very scary what goes on, you know, behind closed doors or without that transparency that consumers deserve. Our company really was, let's have truth in labeling. You know, if we're going to say we're organic, let's be certified, and if we're saying we're natural, let's show really clearly what's in the product and what we say is true is true. The future of organic is at stake. Uh, you know, for a time, I think people were uh, not as 
not as motivated or the concern wasn't there because, okay, we can just buy organic and avoid GMOs, but more and more you're seeing cross-pollination. If you look at a label today, a uh, consumer doesn't know how much omega-3 they need. And One thing we'll see is, is less smoke and mirrors and functional this, functional that, and a movement towards clean, simple ingredient statements and really good taste. And when you scan this code, you can look at each ingredient down to the salt and you can click on that specific ingredient. He's the farmer that grew the spelt in this specific loaf of bread. Health has a long-term staying power. You know, that's something that everybody wants. We have some good solutions for healthy living and healthy eating. What gets me excited about the natural product industry is there's still an opportunity for the small-scale entrepreneur to be involved, to get started, and to make a difference. You come to a show like this and you see you know, an experience where a baby brand has got a DJ that's spinning tunes all day long and starting to serve up purple carrot martinis you know, at night. These are the elements that just bring energy and excitement to what was an incredibly dormant category. This is the perfect place for us to kind of really launch uh, a, a company like this, an economy company like this. Uh, the Natural Channel are market makers. These are people that understand what's next. This is this is about being on the edge of a category and you know that up slope of the bell curve and and um, you know this is the place where we start the conversation. All right, so now we will move on to the first one of the macro forces that we're going to detail uh, today. And this is really about um, dealing with some of the unintended consequences of our food system and food science. And, uh, and this, this, this force we're titling Ancient Wisdom, and it's really about the consumer awakening uh, and wanting to take back control of food and wellness. Uh, there's kind of a re reversion to wanting real whole food nutrition, and this can be seen in the growing movements toward raw, vegetarian, vegan, ancient grains, and even pre-ancient paleo um, uh, diet. And, and these are uh, reversions in, in search of simpler, cleaner products, uh, a little bit of nostalgia to navigate the grocery store and cook safe, nutritious meals. Uh, and, and these are the motivations behind, you know, forces such as CSAs, backyard chicken coops, and roof car rooftop gardens. It's also a reflection of the erosion in trust uh, that consumers have developed, and that um, accrues to government, to corporations, and to agriculture. With the end result that our, our future food is beginning to look a lot like the past. Uh, after 75 years of industrialized food, people are rebuilding local food systems, realizing that governments are not going to take care of this for us. We're on our own, and the new f food world resembles that which existed generations ago, uh, where your uh, grandmother would recognize everything, every ingredient that went into the food. At a sufficient scale, these trends uh, could become directly competitive and certainly are somewhat antithetical to large established industries. Uh, including functional food and potentially dietary supplements that have been built on a foundation of engineered, industrialized nutrition. So what is the implication for you? If you are uh, in the food or supplement industry, you're probably spending an increasing amount of time and effort trying to deconstruct, deconstruct the past and um, honor the sort of complex interactions of uh, micronutrients, which we don't fully understand. A couple of examples here. You're all familiar with Palm uh, and uh, the uh, success that they have made in building a nine-figure business out of a fruit that was entirely unfamiliar uh, to the modern consumer, even though it was in the Bible. Um, it's not about ancient for ancient's sake, but rather a contemporary revitalization of many of those things that our ancestors took to be inherently true about nutrition. This is not what we mean by ancient wisdom, but uh, chia is very much on trend. Um, it's emerging as a new novel ingredient, but it is in its fifth millennium of cultivation, uh, originally domesticated um, in, uh, uh, by the ancient Mexicans. The modern story of the plant begins with the Aztecs and their floating gardens 
the islands were the property of the emperor, and, and the uh, chia seed was considered sacred uh, in time, becoming uh, very widely cultivated um, and uh, uh, right up there with, with maize in a, a very potent little uh, nutritional package, uh, increasingly um, getting the attention not just of foodies, but also performance athletes here are some applications in various food forms. Chia is um, a, in the mint family, uh, native to central South Mexico and Guatemala. It's, uh, it's rich in protein, fat, and fiber, that fat being um, omega-3. It's a very oily seed, uh, and uh, it gets very gelatinous when the seeds are soaked. And uh, you'll see that in that, uh, that red beverage, which is um, which is uh, uh, permeated with chia seeds. Other expressions of ancient wisdom uh, in several, several new products, there's Brad's uh, kale chips and way better snacks, which utilize a whole range of ancient grains. Um, Vitality uh, B complex is an expression of how the supplement world is moving toward whole food nutrition and finding ways to incorporate ancient wisdom into their business. It's all man also manifest in um, a trend we've called the whole agrarian revolution, um, an expression of people wanting to see nutrients in their natural habitat, and is also expressed in natural living, uh, increasingly in cosmetics, an unregulated $50 billion industry with lots of questionable ingredients, and companies who are actually going front of pack with their ingredient labels. Other expressions uh, of this ancient wisdom include um, uh, a, a great emphasis on cultured food, whether it's lactic acid fermentation uh, in uh, um, kefir or uh, kombucha or kimchi. Uh, there's a, a great deal of this uh, emerging in the natural foods industry. And with that, let me hand it over to Carlotta Mast. Thank you so much, John. So I am going to talk about another important force that is really pushing the CPG world and the natural products world toward the tipping point that John talked about a few moments ago. And this is one of my favorite quotes of late. In a world where nothing can be hidden, you'd better have nothing to hide. And a Cargill CEO, Greg Page, made this statement, a statement that not surprisingly went viral very quickly on Twitter um, in April during Fortune Magazine's Brainstorm Green Conference. And as Page pointed out, the three billion middle class consumers that will be living on the planet in the next 20 years are going to, they're going to use a lot of resources, but they're also going to demand a much greater level of corporate transparency. And of course, much of this demand will be centered on food. And in fact, we're already seeing the consumer cry for a food supply, for food supply transparency grow louder and louder, in large part because things like deadly E. coli outbreaks and stomach turning pink slime discoveries, you know, they're really making people increasingly scared of what's in their food. And you know, even the large food companies, the very largest food companies, are attempting to um, really meet this consumer demand for transparency by becoming more transparent, more transparent themselves and really trying to own that transparency story. A, a very recent example is McDonald's. And perhaps you've seen it, but they recently began a Twitter series called Our Food, Your Questions that sheds light on what it exactly is in McDonald's foods. A recent question that was answered was, you know, the question was, when you say 100% beef, do you mean the whole cow, or do you mean just the kind of beef we would expect to buy from a grocer? And the answer from McDonald's was, you know, we use meat that you would expect to be ground beef, not all these other parts of the cow that can be, um, you know, pretty alarming to consumers when they start thinking, what's really in this hamburger? But beyond this, this fear factor, you know, in a disconnected world, in a high-tech world, people are just really 
um, wanting to feel more connected again. And a transparent food supply enables this. All you have to do is go to a farmer's market and, and you see the connection that people you know, are, are able to make when they're able to actually really meet the people who, may, who grow their food and they can you know, really see transparently where this food is coming from. And of course the transparency movement can be seen in really every aspect of society these days, including in the political and military arenas. And as WikiLeaks taught us, nothing, not even government top secrets, can be hidden forever anymore. And kind of a, a very recent example of this is the, the Stuxnet computer virus. And as the New York Times and others have reported, this virus is, is really part of a US and Israeli cyber weapons operation. And that, you know, recently President Obama secretly ordered increasingly sophisticated Stuxnet net attacks on the computer systems that run Iran's main nuclear enrichment facilities. And again, there are few secrets anymore, and such transparency can have very positive effects, but it can also have powerful negative repercussions. And in the case of Stuxnet, you know, maybe it will turn out that this, um, this event makes our commander-in-chief look strong and decisive in an election year, or maybe it will put further pressure on our relationships in the Middle East. So you know, we're seeing transparency everywhere. And there are lots of examples of companies that do a really good job of owning that transparency, and then some that, that don't do as good a job. I talked about McDonald's. I think that's a brilliant campaign for really trying to answer the real questions that people have about what is in McDonald's food. Honest Tea is another great example. The company was really founded on transparency and the story of being very honest. And, you know, that honesty was questioned once Coke you know, acquired honesty and people wondered, will the company really be able to be as transparent as it has been under Coke ownership? And in reality, I think that honesty has done a great job of maintaining that transparency and authenticity. You know, and they do a really great job of really owning their transparency story. They're very adept at controlling that story. One of the Examples of that is just how they've really controlled the messaging around their move to the PET bottles and all the questions around that of are they really sustainable, why aren't you using glass. And they've really been very forward with consumers and explaining that you know, these bottles are in fact more sustainable. They're also, they have a new campaign called Refreshingly Honest and it's designed to be even more transparent about every ingredient that goes into an honest tea beverage. Now a, a recent not so great example of a company losing control of the story is Kellogg's Kashi. And you've, I'm sure you've seen this was an, another thing that went viral um, in social media. And uh, there was a green grocer, the, the name of the grocer was Green Grocer in Rhode Island, and the guy who owns that store, he learned, he read a report about um, natural food companies that have GMOs in their product. And he thought, you know, I really don't want to carry these products anymore. So he removed them from his shelf. Kashi was one of the brands. It was not the only brand. But he wanted to be transparent with his customers. So he put this placard up on the shelf explaining to consumers why they could no longer find their favorite Kashi products in this store. And this really unleashed a consumer um, outcry over Kashi and why did they have GMOs in their products and what were they doing about it. And the company actually had been working for quite some time to, to gain non-GMO project verification for their, their, their brands. It's a, it's a long process. But you know, the, the PR nightmare that occurred around what this one grocer did, it really forced them to come out much earlier and announce their non-GMO verification plans. And you know, they lost control of that story. And um, I think you know, that could have some, some deep harm to the, to the Kashi brand. Now, we're going to show a, a video. We saw a little bit of this in the first video that John showed. But you know, there are natural product companies um, that are really taking transparency to a whole new level. And One Degree Organic Foods is one such example. We have 100% consumer traceable ingredients. So when you look at any one of our products, you'll see that we actually have a QR code that we print on each bag 
And when you scan this code, what happens is it will pull up an ingredient profile for every ingredient that we have in our bread. You can look at each ingredient down to the salt. And you can click on that specific ingredient and you can look at a video. He's the farmer that grew the spelt in this specific loaf of bread. And you can do that literally for each ingredient. The consumer in the aisle looking at the bread can know exactly who grew their food. So this, this so idea of being, using QR code technology to show a consumer where every single ingredient in a product came from, and even connecting it to the story of that farmer who produced that ingredient, that might seem niche or even radical and, and definitely difficult for a large food company to pursue. But you know, this is really the wave of the future in terms of transparency in the packaged food world. And really, every natural products company, every food company operating today has to be focused on how it can become more transparent in a world where, that, where consumers are de demanding that transparency and supply traceability. And One Degree Organic Foods is, is one example of that, but um, there are others. Brooklyn Salsa Company, another small brand that, that I first discovered at Natural Products Expo West this year, is like One Degree Organic Foods in that they're very selective when it comes to choosing the farmers that source the ingredients for their products. They only want to work with um, farmers that they can get to know. They don't want to work with big kind of corporate organic farms. So they're sourcing their ingredients from rooftop farms in New York City, from next generation startup farms, from seventh generation organic farms, and even cooperative community gardens so that they can really tell the story of how their food is produced and provide a level of transparency that you know, we used to have you know, a long time ago in our food, but we, we, just, we don't have it anymore. And that's where we're moving back toward, toward that level of transparency. And we're seeing this not just in food. Sprout Skin Care is a great example of a natural personal care company that is really focused on transparency and the founder of this company makes all of her products by hand in small batches, and they use fiber-less food-based ingredients, things like raw apple cider vinegar, organic olive and coconut oils, organic almonds, organic oats. And you know, those ingredients are highlighted on the front of the label, which is something you never really see in personal care products. And that's it. It's a very simple story, and this company has been doing very well by being extremely simple and transparent in the products. And you know, a couple of examples in the supplement world, I think Gaia Herbs is, is really um, one that has, has, is really pushing the envelope in terms of uh, supply traceability for their herbal products. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, their Meet Your Herbs program, which they rolled out at Expo West a few years ago, where um, it's very easy to trace exactly where herbs were sourced for their products using um, their website and just taking a, a code that's very clear on the bottle and putting it in there. We're seeing this type of technology used by a lot of companies, Kroger, for their, um, their uh, private label produce business, they, they have invested in the harvest mark um, traceability technology. But you know, just kind of one lesson here, I, we have King Supers, a Kroger company here in Boulder, and I, will, I, I bought a bunch of their organic produce that had the harvest mark seal, and I tried to use it, and I could not get the code to work on any of the products. So it's a nice, nice campaign, but it better work if you're really going to um, try to, to be transparent. And I think that experience for me turned me off more than just not even having, a, you know, having the harvest mark on their products. And, you know, and finally, just in conclusion, I think with, um, as, you know, the quote I started with about, you know, nothing can be hidden, so you better have nothing to hide. It's, it's more true than ever, it, in large part because power is really shifting from companies to consumers because of the internet because of social media and because of you know all of these new tools that consumers have to really 
get behind a product and understand what goes into it and, and understand the truth behind a product. And Fujicate, shown here, is just one such example. And with that, I will turn it over to Kevin. And let me just interrupt for a second. Uh, thank you, Emil, for your comment. And Joseph, we will make this available in a uh, recorded version. Uh, we did not encounter audio problems in our dry run, so we're not quite sure what's up, but apologize for that. Okay, thank you, Carlotta. So we've got one last macro force to take you guys through. Hopefully the audio holds up. Uh, and the final one we're going to talk to, about today is deconstruction. Uh, and I, I would say this macro force of all of them is at least a little bit inherent to the natural products industry, uh, a driving force for many years. But we're seeing really strong acceleration of this trend, both within the industry and outside of it. <clears throat> This is being driven in part by uh, broad and mainstream advances in technology, as well as a shift in both consumer behavior and values. Uh, so for our purposes, deconstruction is most prominent in two areas that we'll go into a little detail on. One is innovation, where product is beginning to take a backseat, backseat to process. And a second one is design, where something we call raw messaging is increasingly emerging. So we're going to take this back out of the industry uh, to start and, and look at it more from a societal basis. And uh, as John mentioned, we've done some uh, our Futures 2020 work here at SRG. And one of the uh, opportunities we discovered in that process, we call it elegant reduction. And it's very similar. Elegant reduction is all about deconstruction, just right engineering and economy and design. But the word simple doesn't really do it justice. It's about delivering profound and complex functionality, but in very simple and intuitive ways. Uh, in many cases, leveraging the innate wisdom of natural systems as a shortcut. One example, example from the technology world is the disruptive influence of the MP3. For many years, the music industry uh, continued to strive for higher and higher fidelity. Uh, and with each successive technology, they delivered a higher uh, level of fidelity than the previous one could. And historically, the market grew bigger as the fidelity grew better. The MP3 very quickly reversed that. It's actually a much lower quality sound than a CD, but it turns out that almost nobody cares because it's cheap, portable, and permanent, and that's what people really valued. Uh, if you look at the chart, the chart here, the shock is that the MP3 really destroyed a very healthy industry. Uh, and it destroyed it for the people that are really not participating in the, in the new version of it. So the benefits, it turns out, were profound in this case to both Apple and the consumer. Uh, we've got one more video here, and this, this is from Brendan Sinnott of Revelry Brands, and he's going to talk about innovation in the natural product space. For those of you who don't know, Brendan founded Bare Naked Granola and now runs a small food and beverage-based private equity fund called Revelry innovation in this industry. It's such a funny concept to me because we're in the natural organic space, which means we're about deconstructing all the food that's been uh, mass produced over the last 70 years. Innovation in this, in this industry is, well, we're just gonna go back 100 years and do it the way we did 100 years ago. And not only are we going to do it the way we did it 100 years ago, which everybody can get access to, so everybody has that information, I'm going to tell you exactly who makes my product, why I make my product, what's in my product, where I make my product, where I produce it. I have to be totally transparent with the consumer for them to believe. And when I'm transparent with the consumer, that means that I'm transparent with the consumer and then also all my competitors. So all my competitors see exactly what my value proposition is to the consumer. Innovation in this business, to me, is not just about a brand, it's not just about a package, it's not about copy, it's about really constructing from, from the place that you produce the food or source the food all the way to how, how your product makes the consumer feel. That whole linkage, you need to dial in a way that is um, authentic and is truthful and is resonating and is um, something that you know, you're basically handing the blueprint to everybody to copy because everybody has your secret sauce in a sense. You know, that ha has really informed my own private equity approach to this space. I don't think we can just write a check and then chance that a company is gonna grow as fast as they need to. 
because as soon as you start growing, everybody notices you, everybody's gonna come in and copy you, everybody wants to invest in the space now, so there's more competitors than ever. So you need to get ahead of it, go create your own market, and, and to me, if you're not number one in the category or don't create your own category, there's no points for second place because everything can be copied. Okay, we've got about five more minutes of content and then we'll uh, keep it open for Q&A. Uh, so if you've got some time, uh, we'd appreciate uh, the discussion. Uh, so what we're going to show now is just a few examples of products uh, and companies that are really doing a good job uh, showing the deconstructive side of innovation. Uh, these again are things that we found over at Expo West. And the first one we'll talk about here is Jones Soda. Obviously the company's been around for a while, but uh, what they launched, or at least what they uh, showed off at Expo West, uh, is this 100% all natural soda. Uh, and the genesis of this innovation is really interesting. Uh, their CEO, Bill Meissner, said, a few years back, the Harvard School of Public Health issued a call to beverage manufacturers to create a new class of beverages with very specific calorie and sugar architectures. We took that seriously and wanted to be the first to meet it in a sparkling format, and we then upped the ante by making it all natural. So the idea here uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health was to have less than one gram of sugar per ounce of beverage. As it turns out, Jones's version here has seven grams of sugar and 16 ounces. In addition, and perhaps as a result of that, there are only 35 calories, and uh, very unique to the CSD world, there are five grams of fiber in every bottle. Another company we really like is Back to the Roots in the top right there. Their main product today is a do-it-yourself gourmet mushroom garden, uh, but how they got there is much more interesting because everything they sell comes from trash. Their most significant raw material is spent coffee grounds, which they are now paid to collect from 32 different Pete's coffee shops in the Bay Area. Uh, and they use those spent coffee grounds to grow oyster mushrooms. In the process, they generate a lot of their own waste in the form of more spent coffee grounds. And at first, they had no idea what to do with those grounds, so they piled them up outside the warehouse. And after a couple of weeks, uh, their landlord called them and got really angry with them. Uh, so they're forced to make a decision, and, and uh, what they did is they threw it in bags and sold it. And as it turns out, it's a really high-quality premium soil amendment. So they're not only starting with waste, they're actually selling their waste and creating a new re revenue stream out of that. Uh, and as their business and do-it-yourself kids grew, uh, their customers, and specifically Whole Foods, uh, asked them for some shelf merchandisers to help sh sell more. Uh, they showed the buyer an off-the-shelf option, and he rejected it immediately. Uh, so they, they went back to the drawing board and they tried to figure out a way to do this better. Uh, and what they did was they went to Home Depot, found some old pallets that once again they get for free, and they started building their own shippers. Uh, these guys have made a business out of, out of other people's trash, and they have a great TED Talk uh, if, you, if you have time to check it out. Uh, and then in the supplements world, we've got mega food. Uh, they've always been an innovator in Whole Foods supplements, and Whole Foods supplements in and of itself is, is a little deconstructionist. Um, but their investment strategy is also pretty interesting. They have invested a lot of money in their warehouse to actually expand their warehouse uh, in order to slow down the way they process ingredients. Uh, they call that process slow food, and the idea behind it is to optimize the nutrition they deliver in every pill. On the, on the raw messaging side, uh, here's a few more options. Um, the very first one on the top left uh, is, is very self-evident. This is blueprint juice. Uh, and for anyone who has not ever had to manage a client through messaging priority in a packaging design product, you'll, you'll notice how simple it is here. These brands are saying more by saying less. The packaging for blueprint is really nothing more than a transparent PET bottle and a very short ingredient list. But the message of clean, simple health is striking. Three Twins on the bottom left sells a very simple product, ice cream, uh, with an equally simple message. It's inconceivably delicious ice cream. They don't mess around with low fat, less fat, low sugar, or anything else. It's just great tasting ice cream. And then Sir Richard's condoms. You saw uh, Jim Moscow, their CEO, on the video. 
And they could arguably be on both pages. From an innovation standpoint, they're disrupting a huge mature category that has seen very little innovation recently. And they're doing so with a very simple, straightforward message that if it were appropriate, kids could understand. So that's, that's all we're going to look at today in terms of, these, in terms of this macro force. Uh, this was just three of the macro forces. We actually put together about 10. We're not going to present these right now, but uh, would love to have you guys take a look at them and email us about any that you find particularly interesting and uh, you'd like to hear more about. There's a couple, couple more here. The, the one thing we'll draw attention to is just number seven, organic in 2012, credentialed, legitimate, certifiable, meaningful, but tired, beleaguered, milk toast, maybe even irrelevant. And then on, uh, on, the, on the last page here, number nine, uh, we'll, out of every eight investment dollars under management now, it's in a sustainable and socially responsible account and the notion that true partnership demands common values. Okay, uh, where we'll leave you here is, you know, we, we obviously spent some time talking about specific products and brands, and we do that because it's a nice way to illustrate uh, those forces that we see cropping up throughout the industry. Uh, but that's, that's not really the focus. We, we do, uh, our intent with this uh, was to identify the products, people, and forces that are changing the natural products landscape so that people can really plan for the future. Uh, the last thing here is an infographic that shows some of the trends we identified in natural, organic, and functional food and beverage specifically, and how we think their importance will change over time. So those on the top half of the drawing are things that we think are going to get more important. Anything uh, below the uh, middle line or on the bottom are things that are important today or more important today than they will be tomorrow. So something like food villains, for example, on the far right, uh, there, there is a lot of energy in the natural products uh, and natural food and beverage world on exposing those vill villains and eliminating them. It's, it's driving a significant amount of volume today. We think over time that's going to go away. And you can see on the, in the top right in the middle, we see healthy tastes good as very important in the future. Taste, historically, was not really the strong suit of the natural food and beverage world, but that's changing, and that's going to be vitally important moving forward. We believe these, these trends and these forces are indicative of where both natural and conventional food and beverage are going. But, you know, we took some time to talk about this in society as well, and we think consumer packaged goods broadly uh, are going to move in the direction of many of these trends. So lastly, we wanted today to be valuable and insightful in its own right uh, and to, to really share a lot of this content that we've developed with you guys. Uh, but we think there's much more value in this report than we could ever present, and we're very proud of, of what we put together. Uh, so if, if you found today valuable, uh, we, would, we would love for you guys to go online and buy a report so that we can do this, uh, this venture again next year. Thanks very much for your time, and we'll uh, keep it open for a few minutes for Q&A.